Welcome to the Cisco Netacad CCNA Introduction to Networks video series by Jason Johnson. This video is Chapter 5, Ethernet. The materials in this video cover the 6.0 version of Cisco Netacad CCNA Introduction to Networks course. Thank you for watching these videos. Your time is appreciated. If you find the material helpful, you can subscribe to my channel. And remember to click the notification button if you want to see when I post new content. If you have any questions, you can leave a comment below. And if you watch to the end of the video, I'll have links to the next chapter. Okay, well, let's take a look here at Chapter 5, Ethernet. What we're going to do is uh, we're going to have three parts to the Ethernet chapter. We're going to talk about Ethernet protocol. Uh, we're going to look at the sublayers and the Ethernet MAC address. We're going to look at LAN switches. And we're going to, you know, everything about that, how switches operates and so forth. And then we're going to look at address resolution protocol, or ARP. And we're going to take a look at that. So let's move ahead here and we're going to talk about the Ethernet protocol in 5.1. Now when we talk about the Ethernet frame, um, Ethernet encapsulation, let's talk about that term first. Ethernet encapsulation is when um, the Ethernet operates in the data link layer and the physical layer. So when you're thinking about the OSI model and you're thinking about those seven layers, and I told you in a previous video um, or in a previous yeah previous video that you really do need to memorize the OSI layer and the TCP IP layer. But in layer one and layer two, that's where the Ethernet operates. So the Ethernet supports data bandwidth from 10 megabits through 100 gigabits. And Ethernet standards define both the layer two protocols and the layer one protocols of the OSI model. And when we're looking at the TCP IP model on that too, but the Ethernet standards define that layer two protocols and the layer one protocols. Now the MAC sublayer uh, constitutes the lower sublayer of the data link layer and it's responsible for the data encapsulation and media access control. So let's move ahead and take a look at that. So when we are talking about Ethernet, uh, the Ethernet frame, or when we put that, when we remember we talked about the packets and the frames. So when we talk about the Ethernet evolution, Ethernet has been evolving since its creation in 1973. Yes, it's been around since 1973, a long time. The Ethernet frame structure, well, a long time for, for technology. The Ethernet frame structure adds headers and trailers around the layer 3 PDU to encapsulate the message being sent. So the Ethernet frame fields, the minimum Ethernet frame size is 64 bytes and the maximum size is 1,518 bytes. And that's something, um, I don't know if you need to really memorize that, but that's probably something you may see on a test or an exam question, uh, the Ethernet frame size. Now the frames, frames smaller than the minimum or greater than the maximum are dropped. And the reason they do that is because anything smaller or greater could be the result of collisions or unwanted signals. So a collision means that you get data that hit each other and didn't come all the way through, so you have an incomplete frame. And if it's lower than 64, you know, let's say if it's 61 bytes, they know that that's an invalid frame. And if it's 1,520, they know that it got extra signal information in there, and there's ones and zeros in there that could be corrupt or not wrong information, so they just drop those frames as well. And so if you look down here at the uh, image, you have your preamble, you have your destination MAC address, media access control address, your source MAC address, your ether type, your data, your data is all right here, and then your FCS field. And then that is all from anywhere from 64 bytes to 1,518 bytes, that, that data there. Now, when we talk about the Ethernet MAC address or MAC addresses, the MAC address or media access control address, um, it's written in hexadecimal. Um, it's 48 bits long and expressed as a 12 decimal 12 hexadecimal digit. And I apologize, I don't have an image here on the screen here. Uh, but the IEEE does require vendors to follow two simple rules. Uh, the vendor must use the assigned OUI as the first three bytes. So if you look at a machine address code or if you look at a MAC address, you can look at the first three bytes and you can research that on the internet and you can find out who um, or who the OUI, or who the vendor was of that of that NIC card or of that device, because those are required by the IEEE to be used. And then the last three bytes can be assigned uh, by the uh, vendor. So all MAC addresses with the same OUI must be assigned a unique value in the last three bytes. So when you have those uh, six bytes of information uh, written in hexadecimal, the vendor writes the first three, or the, the vendor is given the first three, so you always know who the vendor is, and the last three are written uniquely by the vendor. Now, when frames are processed, the NIC card 
compares the destination MAC address in the frame with the device's physical MAC address stored in RAM and compares those. And if there's a match, that frame is passed up the OSI layer. So in other words, if I have an end device and my NIC card says, oh, okay, well, I just received this frame and it's got a MAC address and it does match the MAC address on this device uh, in the table. So I'm going to go ahead and pass this information up. If it doesn't match, it passes it on. It discards that frame. Now, it reads, the, it reads all the way up to the destination MAC it then discards the rest, but it does read it partially. So it does read all frames that come across that local area network. So here we go. Here we, ha we have a representation of a MAC address here. They can be re represented with colons, dashes, or dots, and they are case sensitive. Or I'm sorry, case insensitive. So it doesn't matter if you capitalize B or C here. It just doesn't matter. See, that's, that's one way to write it there with dashes, colons, or dots. Uh, most often you're going to see it written with the colons like this and all uppercase. In a lot of cases you're going to see that. Sometimes you'll see it written this way uh, with dashes. Um, rarely do you see it with dots, but you can see it that way. Uh, like I said, usually you're going to see it this way right here. And so these first three bytes are assigned by the, are assigned to the vendor. And these last three bytes here are assigned by the vendor as a uh, unique identifier inside that company or when they, when they manufacture that. Now, the Ethernet, uh, the unicast, let's talk about unicast broadcast and multicast because this does cause some confusion sometimes on what the differences are. Uh, a, unicast address, um, a unicast address used when a frame is sent from a single transmitting device, so one transmitting device, to a single destination device, so one-to-one. -one. That's the way I like to write that out. It's a one-to-one. -one. The source MAC address must always be a unicast on there. Now, a broadcast MAC address is used to address all nodes in the segment. The destination MAC address is the FFFFFFFFF. It's a 48 ones in binary. Now, that's a little bit different here. Let me, uh, let me erase that. And that's one to many or one to all. One to all. Actually, that's, that's a one to all because that's everything that's on the network. It's going gonna, it's gonna to send it out to everything. Now, a multicast MAC address used to address groups of nodes in the segment or endpoints. The multicast MAC address is a special value that begins with 01005E in hexadecimal, and the remaining portion of the multicast address is created by converting the lower 23 bits of the group into six hexadecimal characters. So it might look something like that. There, five, three. Oh, no, that's not, that doesn't have a. That's not the MAC address. That's not a multicast one there. But what the multicast does is that one sends to uh, what I like to say one to some, to some of them, or one to a group. One to a group. So it'll it'll go. It'll, let's just let's just write it this way here. So you have one, and let's say I have uh, three on here, and it will send it to this one and this one. So it sends it to group, but it does not send it to that one. That's what a multicast is. A broadcast goes to all of them, and then a unicast goes to just one. Okay, so that is the difference between unicast, broadcast, and multicast. And I recommend that you understand the differences between those three because you are going to get questions on the exam on unicast, broadcast, and multicast. And you need to understand, not just don't just memorize what they are, but understand why they operate the way they do and why you have those different ones, why you would have a unicast versus a broadcast versus a multicast. Okay, so let's switch gears to LAN switches. So what are switches? Switches are, um, they operate at the layer two of the OSI model. Um, the fundamentals of them is an ethernet switch is a layer two device. So when you hear somebody say it's a layer two or it's, 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 you know, it's a layer two device, you know it's a switch. Um, sometimes you have hybrid, you have hybrid routers and switches and so those are two and three, but we're just talking about just switches at this point. It uses the MAC address to make forwarding decisions. It does not need IP addressing because IP addressing or IPv4, or IPv6 goes to the layer three of the OSI. So the MAC address table is sometimes referred to as a content addressable memory or CAM table. You'll hear that sometimes a CAM table or a content addressable memory. You don't, you don't hear that a lot, but it, it but that's it is what happened. The switch will build a table, a MAC address table. Now, learning the MAC addresses, switches dynamically build the CAM by monitoring source MACs. So as soon as you plug a device into a switch, the switch will start broadcasting and saying, hey, you know, who's out there? You know, who, who is this connected? And the end device, if it's set up properly, 
will broadcast back and say, "Hey, I'm I'm here. Here I am. I'm a I'm a network interface card, and here's my MAC address, and here's the base, basic information." And so the switch then builds that table. So every frame that enters a switch is checked for new addresses, and the frame is forwarded based on the cam. So the switch does really. If you think about what a um, if you if you think about the old time telephone switch operators, or let's just say that you've got a person sitting there at a switchboard and they say, "Okay, who are you calling?" Well, I'm calling number zero zero one. Okay, well let me plug you into that person. And then the next one says, okay, I'm calling 003. Well, that, they, they plug it into 003. But you're not actually routing it outside the network because that's a router. You are keeping it internally on that local area network. So that's what that's what, how the Mac and the Layer 2 works on there. And it also can filter frames. Since the switch knows where to find specific Mac addresses, it can filter frames to that port only. And so filtering is not done in the des if the if destination Mac is not present in the CAM. So once the table's been built it can dynamically forward those uh, frames, but it needs to build that table first to be able to do that. So switch forwarding methods, the frame forwarding methods on Cisco switches, it has store and forward and cut through. Cut through switching is fast forward switching. It's the low, lowest level of latency. It immediately forwards a packet after reading the destination address and a typical cut through method of switching. Uh, fragment free switching, um, or I'm sorry, it's store and forward and cut through. Fragment free switching switch stores the first 64 bytes of the frame before forwarding. So it does goes ahead and it stores the first 64 bytes and then forwards it. Uh, most network errors and collisions occur during the first 64 bytes. So what that does is that, that makes sure that it's got a valid frame before it forwards it. The fast forward switching just don't care. It's just like, okay, I'm going to read the destination address and it's gone. I, I'm not keeping it. The fragment free switching says, hey, I'm going to be a good guy here and I'm going to try to make sure that this frame is valid before I forward it on. Now, memory buffering on switches, you have port-based memory and you have share memory on there and that allows those uh, tables to be built. Now, switch port settings, you can do some different switch port, different settings on your ports. Duplex speeds, when we talk about duplex and half duplex and full duplex and all that, that gets kind of, sometimes that gets uh, a little confusing for students. But really, what full duplex means is that both ends of the connection can send and receive simultaneously. How I, how I always memorize it is that full duplex just means that everybody can talk at the same time. Half duplex means that only one end of the connection can send at a time. I, here, how I always remember that is when I was in the Marine Corps, uh, or in, even the, uh, earlier in the military, but when I was in the Marine Corps, we sometimes would hook up the old telephone systems where you would have the old hand crank phones and you would have just a regular line running to those and those were half duplex and only one person could talk at a time. And you would do, it's kind of like when you use a radio, um, you know, like a little handheld uh, uh, walkie-talkie and you say, okay, th this, is, this is Jason and I've got a message to send over. And the other person says, okay, I just, I know that you want to send your message to me over. And then I hear the over and then I can then send my message. My message is one, two, three, over, and that's what half duplex is. It has to wait to make sure that it's got uh, the ability to send back and forth. So that's how I know half duplex because only half of the half of the two people or the two connections can talk at one time. So half of it, so half duplex. A common cause of performance issues on Ethernet is when one port on the link operates at half duplex and the other one at full duplex, and that can cause some problems. Uh, so you want to make sure that your ports are set. Whether you run it at full duplex or half duplex, you want to make sure that they're both set the same on there. Now, Auto MDX is a blessing. Uh, it's just it's just a good thing that's come along. It detects the type of connection required and configures the interface accordingly. It helps reduce configuration errors. So what happens is it uh, the the newer devices have Auto MDX on there, and it says, okay, what kind of device is this, or what kind of port is this? What's the what's sending on the other end? Oh, it's full duplex. Well, I'm going to go ahead and set this port to full duplex too. You don't have to go in and fix it. Your you don't have to go in and set it yourself. It's going to auto uh, assign that. Now on 5.3 address resolution protocol or ARP, you'll, you'll hear the term ARP, and that's what you need to need to know that ARP or ARP is address resolution protocol. Uh, that is the MAC and IP. Uh, the combination of MAC and IP facilitate to end-to-end -end communication. And layer two addresses are used to move the frame within the local network. That's that's key to remember. When we're dealing at the layer two, we're staying with inside the local area network. Layer three addresses are used to move the packets through remote networks or outside your LAN. 
And that's why that's when it goes to the routing portion and gets routed somewhere else. So a destination on the same network, physical addresses, MAC addresses, are used for Ethernet NICs to Ethernet NIC communications on the same network. So for example, I'm going gonna, I'm gonna to go over here to the right-hand side right here. So we're communicating on a local network. So the destination MAC address, we're using that, and the PC here, the end device, sends to the file server and says, hey, I need to pull a file down. Well, that server or that endpoint over here says, hey, wait a minute, I'm looking at the MAC address. Yeah, that you're looking for 00A. Um, or 00B, so I'm going to send it back, and now my destination is that, and so it, it, they communicate on a local layer network without being routed. They only use this portion right here, layer two. If it goes outside that, and it's, let's say that you have to go out to the internet, that's when you're going to go to the layer three and start using IP addressing. So destination on remote network, logical IP addresses are used to send packets from the original source to the final destination. Now ARP, Address Resolution Protocol, um, ARP allows the source to request the MAC address of the destination. The request is based upon the layer three address of the destination, if it's known by the source. So ARP functions in resolving IP4 addresses to MAC addresses, so it kind of builds an ARP table, and you'll hear the term ARP table. So it maintains a table of mappings and says, okay, this V4 address has this MAC address tied to it. So ARP uses ARP request and ARP replies to perform its functions. So if you use Wireshark or you use some kind of packet sniffing software on a network, you'll see ARP requests going back and forth on that network saying, uh, everybody's chattering going, hey, okay, here, here I'm, I'm, I'm doing an ARP request, I need your ARP information, and the end devices will be like, okay, here it is, and it, here, I'm gonna update it here, it, it, it's, it's not been updated, it's still the same type of thing, they're, they're talking back and forth. Now if you can remove entries from an ARP table, sometimes you have some issues with ARP, uh, so entries are removed from the device's ARP table when its cache timer expires. There's a cache timer on there, and it'll expire after a time. Or the cache timers, uh, and the cache timers are OS dependent. So the operating system sets those. And then ARP entries can also be manually removed via commands. You can also clear your ARP table when you reboot a switch or reboot a device. Those get cleared because those are not stored long term. Those are stored uh, only while the device is running. So on iOS, you can do show IP ARP. And you'll get, that's down here. I know it's real small. I apologize for that. But that's the, that's what you'll get there. You'll get uh, the protocol. You'll get the address. And you'll get the hardware address. You'll get the type, which is ARP. And then you'll get the interface that it came in on. And then uh, you'll get the age. Like that one was nine minutes ago. These just happened on there. And on Windows, you can do uh, go into a Windows command line. And you just type ARP space dash A. And you'll see your, your, you'll see your ARP table on your Windows machine. And on Linux and, App, and Mac, there, you can do those as well. But... Uh, I'm only going to cover the windows based upon what we're covering in this class here. Now, when we have ARP issues or we run into some problems here, uh, ARP broadcast can flood the local segment. So if all devices are powered on at the same time, they start doing ARP requests and it can take up bandwidth. Um, or you can have a um, you know somebody getting in um, wrongly over here and saying, I'm going to send an ARP reply and pretend to be the default gateway. So this device over here is using some kind of hacking software, some kind of um, some kind of software that's saying, "Hey, I'm going to broadcast that I'm the default gateway, and I'm going to spoof it." And so that can be a, a threat in there if somebody gets in physically to your network and connecting. So attackers can respond to requests and pretend to be a providers of services. Example: a default gateway, and then um, request from this end. It says, "Oh, okay. Well, wait a minute. This switch." This switch is saying, I'm, I'm requesting the default gateway, and the switch gets spoofed. And so the default gateway is normally down here, but the switch says, oh, wait a minute, it's over here now. So all of these requests to go out to the internet start coming through this device, and then this person can sniff the rest of the traffic and then read the rest of the traffic that's going through, not just, not just the ARP request and not just the, uh, the tables, but they can receive other information as well. So that's, that's a security concern. Okay, so in Chapter 5, we looked at uh, the operation of Ethernet, we looked at how switches operate at a very basic level, um, and that's where we are with this chapter here. You're going to get a lot more in the Netacad course uh, in Chapter 5. You're going to get a lot more in-depth information in the reading, so make sure that you check that out. And then we also looked at how address resolution protocols uh, enable communication on a local area network. On a local area network. All right, so that has been the Chapter 5. We're going to conclude here. I just want to say thank you for watching my videos, and make sure that you hold on a few seconds, and I'm going to have links to the next uh, chapters, and I hope you have a great day.